The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined in his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Most days, I love the lectionary. On any given Sunday, we know that there are Christians all over the world who are hearing the same words from the Bible. There is thought to the lectionary. Readings are chosen carefully to complement each other and to try to give us an expansive overview of all that the Bible has to offer. But then I look up the readings for a Sunday like this one, and I read Jesus' words, and I wish that I could avoid addressing what the lectionary is telling me to. Do I have to talk about marriage? divorce and remarried after divorce. I wish that I could swap this reading for one where Jesus simply talks about how much we are loved, but I can't. And maybe that's why even when it's hard, I still love the lectionary, because I trust what it makes me do. As much as I might not want to, it's important that we recognize that these words are in our gospel. And it's important that I tell you that I struggle with this passage, that it can be difficult to find where the good news is in these words that sound very harsh to our ears. So in the end, we stand with grace. I come to preach to you this morning, trusting in the abundant grace of God that seeks to give life rather than take it away. And that God's desire for relationship and reconciliation is greater than we can imagine. Let's wade in together. Jesus quotes Genesis. Jesus takes us all the way back to the beginning of creation. In the creation story we heard this morning, God says, it is not good that man should be alone. This is in the second chapter of Genesis, the second account of creation. And the first is that refrain that you just heard me use with our kids that refrain that repeats over and over again, that God creates and then sees that it is good. The thing is, though, God says that things are good as they are created in relationship with something else. Darkness with light, sky, dry earth and seas, earth and plants, stars, moon and star, sun, moon and stars swimming animals and birds together, every kind of living thing on the earth. These things are called good, not just in and of themselves, but because of the way that, re that they relate to the other parts of creation. But the human is alone. The human has no one to be in meaningful relationship with. It is not good that the man should be alone. Genesis tells us that relationships are good, and not just any relationships, but reciprocal relationships, where power is shared. This is where our English translations do not always help us. When God says, I will make the man a helper as his partner, we tend to think of helper as being lesser, right? 
so we can just kind of, you know, chips in a little bit. Someone who tags along and does some work but has no real power in that situation, the sidekick. This verse has been used this way for millennia as justification in attempts to oppress women. After all, if women are only supposed to be helpers of men, then why do they need to vote? Why do they need to drive a car? Why do they need to have a credit card? The funny thing here is, the Hebrew word for helper in the Old Testament, most of the time when it's used, it is used in reference to one specific being, and that's God. Most of the time, when the Hebrew word for helper is used, it's used to talk about God being our helper. And we certainly do not think about God being our sidekick or someone who tags along to chip in every once in a while. This relationship that is begun in creation of this man and this woman tells us that we are not meant to be isolated. We are not meant to be completely alone. We are meant, created in fact, to be in relationship with one another. And so Jesus' broader message in this passage is about the sacredness and importance of mutual relationships. Marriage in the ancient world, as you may already know, was mostly a transaction of property. Property in the form of wife, of land, of livestock, of money. And the law of Moses said that a man could write a certificate to divorce his wife, and there did not need to be any kind of real reason. A husband could write his wife off for virtually any infraction, real or imagined. And the life would then be left abandoned with no legal right to anything, and an outcast in society. This is another case where Jesus is standing up for the vulnerable in society. And it's seen that way because of how he follows up this talk of divorce with the little children who are brought to him. Also people who are seen with no power, no status in society. Jesus' ultimate concern here is for people who are not heard in the world. He is concerned about what happens to women and children and all who have no power or agency in the power structures of society. He knows that by engaging people in relationships with one another, the vulnerable will always be cared for. Because when we have those networks of support, it catches and keeps the vulnerable from falling through. If we safeguard our relationships, in this case, the marital relationship, then this one person cannot be cast out into the cold. And of course, the relationships that are life-giving, that are supportive, that are mutual, are found in lots of ways other than marriage ceremonies. Some people may not ever marry, either by choice or by circumstance. Some people who get married discover that their relationship is not healthy, is slowly sucking the life from them. For some people, it is in the separation that their wholeness is found. God desires relationships for us that help us grow and learn and that bring us abundant life. And these relationships can be found with family members, with old friends who know every embarrassing thing we've ever done, with co-workers who might be the only people who truly know what we do on a daily basis. The mutual reciprocal relationships in our lives, those are the ones that, in which God takes great joy, no matter what they look like or who they are with. Several years ago, I remember hearing a story about a family in Ohio. The daughter had been raised by her parents, and after her parents got divorced, a stepfather also entered the picture when her mom got remarried. She was close with all three of these parents in her life. She was getting married herself, and as most women do, she asked her father to walk her down the aisle. The wedding day came, and the father-daughter pair began their journey to the groom. Partway there, the father abruptly left the bride walked to the front of the seats. He grabbed the hand of the bride's stepfather, pulled him to his feet, and said to him, you helped raise her too, before leading her back 
before leading him back to the bride. And together, these two men, who apparently had not really gotten along <laughs> over the course of this relationship, these two men accompanied their daughter to the next phase of her life. What a beautiful example of how no relationship is perfect, but that our family is what we make it, our community is what we make it. Meaningful relationships can change our lives. They can make us more gracious people. They can hold together broad communities. We have been created for one another, to be in relationship with one another, and of course to be in relationship with God. Our God did not create us and the rest of the universe only to exist completely separately from us. No, our God is one who continually seeks us out. Our God is one who came to Moses in a burning bush to rescue the Israelites from Egypt because God heard the cry of the people. Our God is one who wrestled with Jacob throughout the night. Our God is one who came in the form of the Holy Spirit to inspire the disciples and sustain the church. And most importantly, our God is one who came in the person of Jesus Christ to live among us, eating, drinking, laughing, touching, mourning, suffering, and dying. The psalmist writes, what are mere mortals that you should be mindful of them, human beings that you should care for them? What are us mere mortals? What are us humans? We are beloved creations made in the image of God to be in relationship with God and with one another. Amen.